Okay, here's what we got, guys. Work and energy. Work energy theorem. Basically, the rest of the unit. Okay? Work energy theorem is the single most important concept in science. My opinion, but okay? It basically is. Especially if you're going to take physics 20 and physics 30. Work energy theorem is part of absolutely everything and when you go on in physics. All right? Energy is the ability to do work. And work is a transfer of energy. All right? So, you can't do one unless you have the other. Okay? Can you transfer energy, that is do work, if you don't have any energy? No, you can't. Okay? So it's not really a lie when you say to your mom, I don't want to shovel the driveway because I've got no energy. Okay? But you do. Okay? You just don't want to. But the statement, if it was actually true that you had no energy, would be true. You would be unable to transfer energy to the snow in shoveling it if you actually had no energy. All right? Now, in order to do work or to have energy, sorry, in order to have energy, you have to get that energy from somewhere. Now, here's where this becomes more of a chemistry thing, chemistry and biology kind of thing. Okay? Where do we get our energy from? Food. Okay? We get it from food. Food is chemical energy. Right? We convert that chemical energy into various forms, which can then be used to do mechanical work. Okay? Our muscles convert that into mechanical energy, okay, and we're able to do work. So, this work energy theorem thing is obviously huge for physics, but it's also related to some of the stuff that you're going to take in bio, and some of the stuff that you're going to take in chem. Okay? So, it's really important that we understand that energy and work are different. Okay? But you can't have one without the other. Right? So energy is the ability to do work, where work is a transfer of energy, okay? of mechanical energy specifically. All right, so work energy theorem. Okay? Um, work energy theorem is what I've said now three times. Work is a transfer or change in energy. Okay? That's the work energy theorem. All right, work and energy can be equal, but one cannot exist without the other. Okay, they can be equal. I mean, if I have, let's say, a thousand joules of energy, I can do a thousand joules of work. Okay, so you know that they can be equal sometimes. Okay, understand uh, kinetic and potential energy. So we're going to talk about the differences, similarities, and differences in those. Okay, kinetic energy you have if you are what? Moving, right. Kinetic energy is energy due to movement. Potential energy is energy, at least in this unit, due to position. Okay? Gravitational potential energy. You have that as long as you are not standing where? On the ground. Okay? Anytime you have the ability to fall, you have potential energy. Right? There are other kinds of mechanical potential energy, like elastic potential energy. We don't talk much about that in Science 10, okay? but that would be what a stretched rubber band or bungee cord, a compressed or stretched spring would have, okay? stuff like that. Anything that can be stretched and then would try and return to its original shape can have elastic potential energy. A bow and arrow is a prime example of that. Okay? And we'll use that actually as an as example of work energy theorem a lot. Okay, and then understand the relationship between force and work. All right, so let's look at that first. There's a formula on your formula sheet that looks like this. Work equals force times distance. Okay, there's also a formula on your sheet that says work is a delta E. What did we say delta meant the other day? Change, right. So this is a change in energy. All right, those two formulas are often going to be set equal to each other when we're doing problem solving. Okay. Now, if I'm just looking at this force part here, the force distance part and work, if I push harder, that is, exert more force, will I do more work? Yeah, right? I mean, if I'm multiplying this number by this number to get work, then yes, if this number gets bigger, work gets bigger. Okay? By the same token, if I exert the same force, but I do it twice as far, I will have done twice as much work. Okay? So it's a linear progression here. All right. So, energy just like motion is a measurable quantity, okay? Um, we measure an object's ability or capacity to do work. So, that's that's what energy is. That's your strict definition of energy.
Okay, for example, a brick that is held in your hand, so if you're just holding it here, it has the potential to do work on your toes. Right? If you drop it, it will hit your toes. Now, will your toes gain energy? It sounds weird, but they will. A change in shape counts as having done work. All right? It's not desirable work when it's your toes changing shape, okay? But it's still work. Okay, and then down here, work is the transfer of energy from one object or system to another. And we should probably make a note that this is specifically mechanical energy. Okay, because we don't want to say that work is a transfer of thermal energy, because it's not. Okay, uh, heat is a transfer of thermal energy. No. No, it's a chemical reaction that would cause a change in color. All right, now, the mousetrap. Okay. What kind of energy does that mousetrap have right now? It has potential energy. It, as a result, has mechanical energy. Okay, if it's triggered, then it will snap. Okay, so just so you know here, this is the trigger. Okay, this is the loading bar. This is the killing bar. That's actually what it's called. Okay, and here's the spring. All right. So when you load the mouse trap, do you have to do work? Yeah, you have to exert a force through a distance in order to push that spring back to the other side of the mouse trap. All right. That's where the energy to kill the mouse comes from. It's from you. See, you thought you were distancing yourself. It was the mouse trap that killed the mouse, but it wasn't. It was still you, because without you, the mouse trap wouldn't have any potential energy. Do you all feel guilty or no? Don't. Mice carry the hentavirus. It's disgusting. Okay? All right. So when you do work, you exert a force through a distance, you load this thing up, and then you put the locking bar across. Okay? The locking bar is released when the trigger is hit. Okay? And then the bar swings across. Okay? Is the spring doing work? Yes, it is. The spring's exerting a force against the plate and the bar. Right? And that's what causes it to increase, not its potential, but now it's kinetic. Now it's going to move faster. So its potential energy is going to turn into kinetic as it arcs over and snaps down onto the other side. Okay? So it started out, it was chemical energy in your body. It was turned into mechanical energy when you did work on the mousetrap. That mechanical energy was potential energy stored in the spring. Then the spring converted that potential into kinetic. That kinetic energy did work in changing the shape of the mouse. All right. All these energy transfers occur in order for all of that to happen. Cam, question? Um, it only depletes if it's doing work. Okay. So um, if I, let's say, I'm standing on the top of a cliff, and I just stand there, I'm not going to lose any potential energy. I'm still the same distance from the bottom of the cliff. I always have the same amount of potential. It doesn't go away unless I jump. Okay? And then it doesn't really go away. It just turns into kinetic energy as I fall. All right? And then my kinetic energy does work on the rocks and me when I get to the bottom, okay? which would be undesirable, obviously. All right. Okay. Is that making sense? Okay? So work is a transfer or a change in energy. Now, what are some other forms of energy? Because obviously, not all the potential energy stored in the mouse trap is doing work on the mouse. Is any of it turn? Is any of it turning into anything else? Sound. Yeah, some of it's turning into sound. Okay, some of it is movement of the mouse trap. Actually, okay, like the the plate of the mouse trap bounces when they set off. Yeah, there's probably going to be some heat too. All right, so all of those things are all that energy is still conserved. All right. When you hit a tennis ball with your racket, we say that the, the ball has had work done on it. Okay? How do we know the ball has had work done on it when you serve it? What's that? Right. Will its kinetic energy change as a result of you hitting it? Yeah. Okay. When you throw the ball up in the air to serve it, it's got no horizontal velocity at all. Right? It's not until you strike it with the racket that you make it accelerate. That's when you do work. Okay, everybody follow me there? Now, if you want to serve the ball really well, what are two ways you can, in, you can uh, what are two things you can do to increase the speed of the ball? 
hit it harder. Okay? Remember, work is force times distance. Guys, every single sport you can imagine playing revolves around this equation. Okay? Take it from me. I'm a track coach. Every single event in there has to do with this. Okay? So I could hit it harder. That means increase the force I exert on the ball. What's the other thing I could do? Well, I have that anyway. If I was standing on ice, I wouldn't be able to serve. Right? So what other thing? Okay, hit it straighter. Okay, partially you're on the right track there. Higher, okay. You're on, still on the right track. If I increase either one of these, do I make more work? And that's going to mean more kinetic energy in the ball. All right. So the two things we want are to increase the force. That's you. You body build, you work out, whatever, you get stronger. That's how you increase F. Your equipment is how you can increase D. Okay. Well, technique and equipment are how you can increase D. All right. With modern uh, rackets, obviously the racket is lighter. Okay, they're not made out of wood anymore, like this picture is showing. Okay, they're made out of you know carbon fiber and graphite and stuff like that, so they're much lighter. Can you swing them faster? That's good. That helps. Okay, and the other thing is string te technology is better. Okay, strings are more elastic. If you've ever seen what happens when you hit uh, a tennis ball or even a badminton birdie, if here's the face of the racket, when you hit it, the ball goes behind the frame and the the strings stretch behind. Okay? So when you're in the middle of hitting the ball, the entire tennis ball could actually be behind the face of the tennis racket, stretching the strings. Okay? How is that helping you? Okay? It's giving you acceleration, but how is it doing that? Yep, partially. If the ball can go back into the face of the racket. Here's where I start hitting the ball. Okay? If the if I just hit it with a piece of wood that's not flexible, okay, it's only going to be in contact with that wood from maybe here to here. But if it can go behind the face, I could be in contact with that ball all the way out to here. Does that increase the distance over which I do work? That means I'm going to do more work. All right? And that's the case for anything that involves hitting something farther, okay, or throwing something farther. Okay? Increase the distance over which you can exert your force, and you will give it more energy because you can do more work. All right. When we uh, when we look at things like shot put in track and field, okay, we talk about things called separation. Okay, separating the shot put from the core of your body. The further away it is the greater the distance over which you have the opportunity to push it. Okay? If you just straighten up, you have the shot put right here, and you just push it with your arm, you've got this much distance. But if you bend down and you create an arch in your back, you get more separation. Now you've got this kind of distance over which to push on the shot put before you release it. You'll throw it further. Okay? I've seen small guys with great technique outthrow big, strong guys with horrible technique. Okay? There's, they got no business throwing it really far because they're not very strong, but they have great technique. Okay? So two ways to increase how much energy you can give something. Get stronger, get better equipment, or get better technique. Okay? The, those things will increase the distance. Right? Since at some point you basically always hit kind of an upper limit to how much strength you are going to have, technique is important. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? Yeah? All right, bow and arrow. Okay, bow and arrow is kind of the simplest work energy theorem kind of uh, situation there is. Okay, if I've got the arrow in the bow here, but I don't have the bow pulled or drawn, okay, then how much energy is in the bow? Zero. Yeah, there's nothing in it, right? It's already at its original shape. The string isn't going to move. But if I draw the string back, I change the shape of the bow. Okay? I pull the ends closer together. The ends don't want to be close together. All right? The further back I pull it, to an extent, okay, the greater the distance. Okay? Everyone follow me there? All right. When you let it go, the force of the bow okay, snaps the string forward. Anything that's attached to the string snaps forward with the string. 
All right. So I could calculate how fast the arrow was going to leave the bow by knowing how much force I exert on the bow and how far I pull it back. Okay. I'd be able to calculate the kinetic energy of the arrow. Okay. That's the formula for kinetic energy. We'll talk about it in a minute. But you can see that speed is part of that formula. All right. So I'd be able to isolate speed and figure out how fast it was going to go provided I knew the mass of the arrow. Okay. All right. So works related to force. Greater the force, the more work is done. Okay. Now, mass can affect the amount of energy something has um, based on there's more of it. Okay. It doesn't really affect the amount of work done per se, okay, but it does affect the amount of energy something can have. Picture this. You're standing underneath an apartment window. Okay. There are two things in the window a kitchen sponge, and a piano. Which one do you hope falls on you? The kitchen sponge. Okay, It has no mass. They're falling out of the same window. Okay, They're going to be going the same speed when they hit you. But one will have a lot less energy because it has so much less mass. All right? The piano hits you, you're done. Because right? it has so much more mass, it would have that much more energy. All right. So, for force to transfer energy to an object, the force must make the object move. Again, move, changing shape counts as movement. All right. So, if I've got this situation here, the guy with the golf club, when he winds up, he can exert a certain amount of force. Okay. If he hits a very small mass, like the golf ball, he can produce a great acceleration. All right. He's going to change the velocity of this golf ball by a great deal. Agreed? Yeah, okay? So the work done on the golf ball is obvious. For some reason, he winds up and hits a truck. The truck has an incredibly large mass. Is he going to accelerate the truck very much? No. I mean, if the truck was sitting on absolutely frictionless ice, the truck would move as a result of him hitting it with the golf club. Not very much, but it would. Okay? In the real world, the truck isn't going anywhere. Does that mean he hasn't done any work on the truck? No, he's still done work on the truck because if I'm standing on the front of the truck and I've got my hand on the hood, I know when he hits the truck because I can feel the vibration pass through the truck. In order for a vibration to pass through, does he have to make every particle in the truck move? He does. They just don't move very much. Okay, so it still counts. There's going to be a little dent on the back of the truck where he hit it. Okay, that's a change in shape. Still counts as work being done. All right, but the bigger the mass, the less evidence you're going to have, okay? Because the acceleration will be smaller, right? The amount of work done in either case is essentially the same, but because the ball is so much smaller, it's going to go a lot faster than the truck is, okay? All right. Now, like we said here, this is talking about change in shape. Motion doesn't just mean movement of an object from one place to another. If an object's shape is changed, that's work. When you compress or stretch a spring, you're doing work. Okay? The, the spring's not moving. If I just pull it and hold it, it's not moving, but it's got potential energy in it. I've changed its shape. Okay? Same thing with a rubber band. If you have a slingshot or something like that, okay? and when you pull the slingshot back, it's not moving. It doesn't have kinetic energy, but you've done work. Okay? Everybody follow me there? Okay. All right. Um, so work and heat are transfers of energy. And this is important for us to know. They're both transfers of energy. They're both changes of energy. But they're different kinds of energy. Okay? Um, so the transfer of thermal energy is heat. Okay? The transfer of mechanical energy is work. Well, that E just never worked out right. Okay, everybody with me there? All right. So, potential energy. Okay, you have potential gravitational potential energy as long as you are above the ground, right? Because you have the potential to fall. And if you can fall, then you can turn potential energy into kinetic energy, and that can do work. Okay? 
We use this all the time. Okay? If you've ever used a hammer, that's essentially what you do. Okay? If you've ever used a pile driver, okay, something like that, you bring something up and you drop it. And when it drops down, it can do work. It can pound something into the ground. Okay? All right. So, a rock perched on a cliff in a Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote cartoon has potential energy, as does a stretched rubber band, which, of course, are Wile E. Coyote's, like, old standbys for catching the roadrunner. It's always it always ends up being a rock on the top of the cliff after he's tried the acme whatever, okay, at whatever point. All right. So gravitational potential energy, okay? Like we said, so this is the definition. It's important to know the definition. Okay? Is the potential energy of an object due to its position? All forms of potential energy must be described with respect to a chosen reference point. That reference point is usually the ground. Usually. Okay. All right. Formula for gravitational potential energy. It's on your formula sheet. EP equals M times G times H. Caroline, question. Um, yeah, to some extent, it's more going to be that you've got chemical potential energy in your muscles that are going to that is going to be converted into mechanical energy when you push off, right? Unless you're really elastic, no, not really. All right. So potential energy here. The example we talked about with the sponge and the piano. Mass obviously affects how much energy you can have. The bigger something is, the more energy it has the ability to have. Okay, you'd rather get hit by the sponge than the piano. Okay. Acceleration due to gravity also makes a difference. Okay, if you're let's say jumping from uh, let's say a second floor window, okay, you don't want to do that on Earth because the acceleration due to gravity is quite high and you would get hurt when you hit the ground. But if you were on the moon and jumped out of a second story window, it'd be like stepping off of a desk here. Okay, the acceleration due to gravity is less, so you won't be going as fast when you hit the ground. You won't have as much energy. Okay, your your body could absorb that that shock, okay, better because G is less, okay, and H stands for height, obviously from the higher you drop something from, the more energy it's going to have, all right, those things all make sense, okay, so three things can affect the amount of potential energy you have, your mass, the acceleration due to gravity, which for us is always going to be 9.81 because we're always going to talk about Earth, okay, and the height something is dropped from. Now, these two people here, they're using the oldest machine, okay, the simplest machine, simplest tool known to man, the inclined plane, all right? Who does more work? They're both lifting exactly the same mass to the top of this ramp. Just this guy's lifting it and the girl's pushing it up the ramp. Who does more work? That's what everybody says, okay? Everybody says, oh, it's the guy lifting it. In actual fact, it's not. Okay, so here's the kicker. In the perfect physical world, if there was no friction on this ramp, okay, if there was no friction on this ramp, okay, these two people do the same amount of work. Okay, why do they do the same amount of work? Well, these two blocks have the same mass. When they're both right here, they're the same height above the ground. And acceleration due to gravity is the same for both of them as well. Both of those rocks will have the same amount of energy at the top of the ramp. And since work is a change in energy, they have to have done the same amount of work to get those masses to the top of the ramp. It doesn't matter how you get it there. Its energy at the top is the same. So you do the same amount of work. Now, who has to exert more force? The guy. Okay? Look at this. He has to lift it that far. That's not as far as this girl is going to push it. Okay? The girl exerts less force, okay, over a greater distance. He exerts more force over a smaller distance. In the end, these multiply out and they're the same change in energy. Okay? That's the principle behind the ramp. Okay, the reason the ramp was invented was to allow you to do large amounts of work using less force. 
Okay? It helps you because you don't need to lift something. You can just push it and the ground holds some of the weight. The difference is you have to push it further. Okay? It's a longer route to the top of a ramp, up the ramp, than to lift it to the top. Okay? But it doesn't require as much force. Okay? This is how the pyramids were built. If you think aliens built them, you're probably wrong. Okay? Big, long ramps made of sand. The Egyptians had lots of that. Okay? Lots and lots of sand. You make this really, really long ramp, and you have slaves with these big rocks okay, on like tree trunks, and you're rolling them up this ramp. Okay, by the time they got to the top of the pyramid, it is theorized those ramps may have been well over a kilometer long. Okay, because they couldn't be very steep. You imagine trying to push one of those rocks up the side of the pyramid? Okay, the ramp had to be not as steep. Okay, yes. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so force times distance equals work. Less force means greater distance up the ramp. Okay, lifting it, more force, shorter distance. But at the end, they both have the same amount of potential energy. All right, another example. Looking at this pulley system here. This block is on a table. Okay, we're going to say that it can't fall off of that table. So as a result, this block has no energy. It has no potential energy. It has no kinetic energy. But this ball is hanging. Does it have potential energy? Yes, because it could fall. Okay, if I let it go, it will fall. All right, so all the energy that's in this system is here in this ball. All right, can I calculate how much? Yes, okay, so I can go M times G times H and find out how much energy there is in this ball. Okay, now when I let the ball go, what's the ball going to do? it's going to slowly go down, right? It isn't going to fall like something would normally fall because it has to do what? Yeah, it's got to pull on this mass. All right? So when it starts to fall, some of its potential energy is going to be used to change the kinetic energy of this block. So not all of its energy is going to be used to fall. Some of it's going to be used to pull the block. Okay? Now, which one will accelerate faster, the ball or the block? The same. Okay, A truck and a trailer can't accelerate at different speeds because they're what? They're connected, right? Okay, They have to accelerate at the same rate. Both of those things would accelerate at the same rate. Okay, So at the end of all this, okay, whatever energy was here would be kinetic, but it would be in both of these. It would be split between them. All right. Okay. So here's the formula. Okay, we already kind of talked about it, but the formula for potential energy is mass times acceleration due to gravity times height. Now, what are the units for energy? Joules. Okay, the units for energy are joules. Now, mass is usually measured in kilograms. Acceleration due to gravity is measured in meters per second squared, and height is measured in meters. All right. So kilograms times meters times meters divided by second squared is kilogram meters squared per second squared. In other words, joules. Aren't you thankful we just call them joules? Okay. Then you don't have to remember kilogram meters squared per second squared. All right. But that's what a joule technically is. All right, everybody okay with that? All right, we're going to use that formula quite often. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll try it. We'll do this example here. I think, is this one in your notes? I think it is, right? I put this example in there. So we've got a three kilogram box lifted by an upward force 1.50 meters above the surface of the earth to the top of a table. Okay, I want to find the potential energy of the box in the new position, so I just plug in my numbers M times G times H. Okay. 3 kilograms times G, 9.81, times 1.5 and meters, and I get that it has 44.1 joules of energy on the top of the, of the table. If it were to fall off of the table, how much kinetic energy would it have when it hits the floor? Mm -hmm. 
Remember the first law of thermodynamics. Energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed. How much energy will it have when it hits the floor? Right, same amount, 44.1 joules. Okay, how much work could that object do when it hits the floor? Right, this much. Okay, energy is the ability to do work. If you have 44.1 joules of energy, you can do 44.1 joules of work. That's all, no, no more. Okay, could you do less work? Probably. Okay, it might be turned into other forms of energy. You could lose some energy along the way to other forces. All right. Okay, second example, okay, in case I need to manipulate this formula at all, okay, I have a 55 kilogram diver standing on a diving platform, and when they're on the diving platform, they have 5.4 times, that should be 10 to the superscript 3, okay, so it's 5,400 joules, okay, of energy. What's the vertical height of the platform? So, I manipulate this formula to solve for H. So I divide both sides by M times G, and it cancels, and it comes over here, and I'm left with H equals EP over MG. So 5,400 divided by 55 times 9.81, okay, and we get that this is the 10-meter diving platform. All right, is that a pretty easy formula to manipulate? Yeah. All right. Now, when you release potential energy, it turns into kinetic. All right. It starts doing. It, well, it turns into kinetic, and then the kinetic can do, can do work. Potential energy, really, at least gravitational potential energy, doesn't do any work directly. All right. But when it turns into kinetic, it can do work. Okay. So a falling hammer can drive a nail into wood. Okay. A moving any moving object can do work. Okay. Uh, moving molecules in hot steam can turn turbines. Okay. If it's a windy day, right, the molecules in the air can do work. Okay. If, I mean, if you've ever seen videos of what a tornado can do. Okay. Moving air when it starts when it gets really moving at well over 150 kilometers an hour, it can do a lot of work. It can pick up really big things and throw them around. Okay, it's just a matter of how fast is it going. All right, and moving molecules in a sound wave can make your eardrum vibrate. Okay, that's how we hear things. Changes in pressure caused by sound. Okay, hit your eardrum and your eardrum vibrates back and forth, makes the little bones in your middle ear move, and then they send the vibrations into the middle ear, which translates them into nerve impulses that go to your brain. What's that? Yes, but your ear doesn't work as well underwater because it's not designed to work underwater. It's designed to work with much lighter fluid air. Okay, when you're underwater, you can still hear stuff. That's how synchronized swimmers can stay on rhythm when they're doing their routines. Right? They have speakers under the water; they can still hear the sound. It just sounds different. Your ear doesn't perceive it in the same way because it's traveling faster. Sound travels faster in water than in air, a lot faster. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to show you a couple of quick videos here. Okay, one is of this guy um, setting the world record for sidewalk block breaking. Okay, uh, he's a, a war vet who was blinded by an anti-personnel mine, and he breaks this huge stack. It's almost as tall as me of sidewalk blocks. Okay, it's crazy. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. That's breaking wood. I gotta stop my recording, otherwise I'll get in trouble.